there it is so this is 3050 week 9 lecture 2 so today we're going to continue time response okay which is chapter 4 so we only have two more ideas left in 3050 one is how do you quantify first order systems which we're looking at briefly and then how do you quantify second order systems uh, and based on the first order and second order how do you quantify uh, that is, how do you quantify the time response of higher order systems? So we'll finish 3050 by this week, which is good. So next week, we'll be doing a lot of like examples and that leads into 3720, right? Of course, I'm not gonna cover any 3720 material, but ho hopefully like the break is short enough that you remember all this. Uh, number one, number two, I haven't recorded the MATLAB stuff yet. So what I might do is I might, I'm definitely gonna record it this week, what we covered last week, but I'm gonna add a little bit more like stuff onto the video which will hopefully be helpful to you. Number three, I haven't graded your exams yet. I'll probably get to it like by tomorrow or something. So anyway, recall that this is where we stopped. That is before the exam, we said, all right, let's consider a standard form of a first order system, which is H1 bar, the transfer function. Do you remember what it is? It's A over S plus A, right? So, and then we said, if the input is X, if the output be y, so the output is a over s plus a, the transfer function times the input. And we said, uh, let us quantify. So by quantify, I mean there are some uh, properties of the first order system. Let us quantify uh, y of t, the time response, using a step input and you can put in like oh, through the projector. All right, let me pause that. Continuing, so hopefully the screen doesn't flicker. All right, so we use a. There are many ways to quantify response. All right, one way is to use sinusoidal inputs. But what's the? It's not really a problem. Let's say you put in a sine wave at one frequency. Does it tell you everything about the system? So sine wave at a particular frequency. No. So how do I use sinusoidal response to quantify the complete system? What do I do? You do a frequency sweep, like Connor said, right? That's the frequency response, yes? You get body plots. So the body plot is basically the plot of this transfer function when s equals j omega, but you need omega going from dc all the way to high frequency, yes? That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to use a step input. Okay, so for a DC motor, let's say, which is what we've done in this class, what the transfer, you had an exam yesterday, what is the uh, form of a DC motor transfer function? Like, is it this form? No. So what order is it? It's second order, all right? Just to, so you, it's not this form, you can't use this, but we'll do second order later. Bottom line is for a DC motor, you can put a step input and see what happens, right? For some systems, you can't. It just depends on the system. So right now, we're quantifying using a step input. Therefore, what you will get, y of s is a over s plus a times 1 over s, unit step. So this is 1 over s minus 1 over s plus a. When you do the partial fraction expansion, that's why we use this form, OK? It just works out nicely when you do the partial fraction expansion. And if you do inverse Laplace transform, okay, y of t, you get 1 minus e to the minus a t u of t. So the goal is to relate poles and zeros in the s domain to time response. What's the pole of a polynomial function of s? So what is the definition of a pole? It's the values of s that this makes the expression go to infinity, or if it's a polynomial, it's the root of the denominator. I emphasize polynomial because there is one practical system whose transfer function is not a polynomial, whose Laplace transform is not a polynomial. It's the delay system, right? When you have a delay, x of t minus capital T, for example, the Laplace transform is e to the minus s capital T. So it's not a polynomial, but what you do, you'll hopefully see this in 3720, you can actually approximate an e to the minus x using a Taylor series. 
So that's called as a paired part A approximation. You'll basically make a polynomial out of it. Right? With the polynomials, it's just easy to deal with. Like our rational transfer functions, ra rational functions of S. So poles are values of S that make the rational function go to infinity, or they're the poles of the, de or they're the roots of the denominator. Consequently, zeros are values of S that make the function go to zero. Remember, we're talking about finite poles and zeros, okay? So in that case, these functions don't have any zeros. Finite, is that clear? What is the pole of the input? Where is the pole of this? This is the input, right? Zero, this is negative A, correct? So anyway, you, do you remember what is the first uh, parameter we covered for the time response? For quantifying it, we did. So if you have a first order system, what do you know from your circuits? What is something you can define for it? The time constant, that's the first thing we did. So the time constant is one, and this is denoted by tau, and this is defined as one over A, because Y at T equals tau is one minus E to the minus one U of T, which is approximately equal to 0.63. Therefore, time constant is the time taken for the output to reach 63% of final value. Okay. This you should be familiar with. There is another one called settling time, which we briefly discussed. That's related to your five time constants, okay? But let's look at another one which you may not be familiar with, which is the Actually, let's look at, let's see, what did I do? So I did uh, time constant first. Okay, let's look at rise time. So this is called rise time, okay? Abbreviated TR. And if you look at the back pages of your book, end pages, it has all these um, definitions and expressions, okay? So time constant tau, so let me put this in red, in the sense the time constant is 1 over A, assuming, of course, this is the form of your transfer function, okay? So let me box this. In the sense, if your transfer function is of a different form, you can't, you have to rederive it. Is that clear? Very important, all right? It's because... Given this form, we did all this, uh, we did the step response, we got this uh, expression in the time domain by using the inverse Laplace transform, then we plugged in one over A and got this. Is that very clear? That is, if we had a first order system of the form one over S plus two, or one over S plus three, you can't apply this formula blindly, right? In that case, you have to go back to the definition. So I, I just remember, I just understand and remember the definition. I don't really use this. Okay. All right, so rise time is the time taken for the response to go from 10% of the final value to 90% of the final value. Okay. So, just like we had an expression for tau, we need to get an expression for the rise time. Okay. So, what I want you to do is, uh, let's do this. So, I'll set it up, see if you can derive it. It's a good exercise in math, and I need to take a break. So, the rise time is defined as t2 minus t1, where what is y of t2 according to this definition? Because here is your y, right? Correct? Given we are quantified using a step. So we need to, we can plug it into here and determine the rise time in terms of a. That's what we're trying to do. So what is y of t2? You understand the question? So 
recall that y of t, this is the step response. Okay? Excellent. Why is it 0.9? Yeah, first of all, the final value is 1, right? It's You're putting in a step, but as when as t goes to infinity, the final value is 1. Is that clear? 90% of final value or 0.9 of 1 is 0.9. Okay? Now, therefore, what is y of t1? 0.1. Okay? So now what you can do is you can use equation 1, equation 2, equation 3. Therefore, you say y of t2 is 0.9. 1 minus e to the minus a t2 is equal to 0.9. You can get an expression for t2. Same thing, you can get an expression for t1, okay? And then do t2 minus t1 and find the rise time in terms of a. So do that. I'll give you like five minutes. Take a break and then we'll continue. All right, continuing. So what is tr? What's the rise time? Any expression? So uh, hint, it's only in terms of a. So perfect. So Jacob got it. It's exactly right. Closed form is natural ln of nine over a. Okay, it's approximately two point two over a, and we'll derive this. Yeah. No, it's nine. It is. Let's derive it. Okay. So so, but before we derive it, I want you to notice. A, A, it'll all be in terms of the pole of what? So in our expression here, what is it in terms of? A, right? Which is the pole of? Of what? What is the? A is the pole, or sorry, negative A is the pole of what? The transfer function, okay? Input in this case uh, does not affect Given this form, it doesn't affect the time response. Okay, but let's just derive this. So, so there are two paths here. So one minus e, one minus e to the negative a t two times u of t equals 0.9, right? But you don't need the u of t because this is defined for t greater than or equal to zero. It's 0.9. So let's see, this is 0.1 equals e to the minus t2. Therefore, uh, t2 is you take the natural ln on both sides, okay? You get 0.1, and there's a negative sign, divide by a, okay? Wait, 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 we're not done, okay? It's not over. So there's another one. U of t, whoops, and I screwed this up. It should be t1, is point nine. Ah, I like point 0.9. No, point 0.1, okay? So there's one, same thing. This point 0.1, this implies point 0.9 equals e to the minus a t1, which implies t1 is natural ln of point 0.9 with a negative sign divided by a, yes? No, well, let's do it step by step, right? No, let's start with this. So, therefore, t, what is this, the rise time? Yeah, is t2 is the definition. It's t2 minus t1, which is, and the reason why I'm doing this is you'll see in second order systems, it becomes more complicated. Hold on, let me finish this. No. So it's 1 minus 0.1, right? No, hold on. No, no, no. What are you talking about? So this is 1 minus 0.1 is e to the minus at1, correct? So this is, oh, crap. Don't tell me this is crashing. So this is 0.9 is e to the minus at1, right? Okay? So this is t2 minus t1. So minus natural ln of 0.1 over a. And the reason why I'm doing this to complete what I was saying is 
when you look at second order systems there actually for a lot of these expressions there is no closed form right uh, you have to basically use insight and well mathematical insight and we'll see right it's so minus maybe really careful the negative signs okay so it's t2 which is over here minus t1 which is over here so and this is negative 1 of point 1 over A, correct? So this is ln of point 9 minus ln of point 1 over A. Ln of well, log of A minus B, log of A minus log of B is log of A over B. So this is ln of point 9 over point 1 times 1 over A, which is basically ln of 9 over a. Okay? So that's a derivation. So let me write this in red again. That is, your rise time is also defined in terms of a. So you're hopefully seeing the, starting to see the pattern. And what the hell? That's the rise time. Okay? It's not approximately. It's exactly equal to ln of 9 over a. And it's approximately, you might see some places as 2.2 over a, okay. because ln of 9 is 2.2. I'll just remember ln of 9 over a. It's not that hard. Okay. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to let's see how much time we got. Oh, we got plenty of time, but so let me derive the third quantit quantification as well, which is called the settling time. And we briefly discussed this in the sense it's related to the time constant. And this is abbreviated TS. It's defined as the time taken for the output to reach and stay within 2% of the final value, okay? And this is where your time constant idea comes in, in the sense, some people will say 1%, okay? This is a control engineering what's the word? convention. It's 2%. So again, therefore, y of ts is equal to what? Let me save this. This thing died. Yep. So let me go back in here. So what is y of ts equal to? So a ts, if you get within 2% of the final value, so when it first hits the 2% of the final value, what is, what's the output going to be? 0.98. So there it is. Okay? So you solve this. Plug it in is 0.98 and you get again a negative e to the minus 8 well 0 0.02 equals e to the minus 8 ts so ts is negative natural ln of 0 0.02 over a correct so something about this right in the sense ln of a number less than 1 is negative correct the log of any number less than 1. So that negative sign is important on the outside because your time, Ts, is positive, correct? So just remember all that. And this one you can actually simplify. It's kind of cool. The sense this is ln of 1 over 50, right? You can actually get closed form expressions for these. Yes? 1 over 5 is 0.2. Divide that by a 10, you get 0 0.02. And this is actually what? Minus natural ln, let's be careful here, of 1 minus ln of 50, yes, over A. What's ln of 1? 0, correct? Because E to the 0, ln means basis E. E to the 0 is 1, okay? So this beautifully works out to be exactly equal to ln of 50 over A. And I don't remember what ln of 50 is. So I can ask O from alpha or whatever. Like I'll just use a calculator. So let's do a 50. Where's ln? So it's 4. Okay, it's not five because it's five time constants. Remember, tau is one over a, correct? 
how do you how do you get f five here like what do i have to do let me see if you can think as engineers so i got ln of 50 which is so let me write this out in red so the settling time is exactly equal to ln of 50 over a which is approximately equal to 3.9 or 4 over a okay so my question to you is how do i get five here because you'd like to have five tau right so how do i get five what do i do so what determined my settling time like in other words how did i get ln of 50 let me ask you that forgetting the math how, how, how do i get it let's see if it's yes the definition right so how do i get five here what do i do to the definition do I be more stringent on the percentage or less stringent? That is, do I have to wait longer or I have to wait longer, right? I mean, it's larger time. So what do I do to the percentage? It's, so give me an example of, so will 5% work? No. So around 1%, half a percent, right? So if you want, you can make this equal to the definition of the time constant. But in terms of control systems engineering, this is, it's long, it's 2%. Okay? So it turns out that these are the three quantities, uh, time constant, rise time, settling time, that completely characterize a first order system. But the moral of the story is, this is the, here's the bottom line, right? So the moral is, time constant, rise time, and TS are all defined, or not defined, I'm sorry, are all derived, because we can actually derive it from the definition like we did, in terms of one over a, okay? Since negative a is the pole of h1 bar of s, which is a over s plus a, okay? we can, and this is the most important point, understand how a first order system behaves or a first order systems, let me use time response. Of course, we used a step input, but I'm not going to you can basically, if you know the response to a step input, you know the response to any input. Okay, but the bottom line is you can understand the how a first order system's time response uh, behaves in terms of a PZ plot. What is a PZ plot? Pole zero plot. So let's do a pole zero plot. That is, let's assume the system is stable. That is, A is positive. Okay, so somewhere our, our pole is somewhere here minus a notice this makes sense that is they're all derived in terms of 1 over a because what are the units of s huh radians per second s is j s, can, s is frequency yes so what are the units of 1 over a radian is dimensionless in the sense 1 over a is time correct is that clear so this all makes sense. That notice that the units of one over a is time. Okay, so of course it makes sense. So let me ask you this: If I move this pole, let's say I want my system to settle quickly. Okay, where do I move this pole? To the right or to the left? To the left. Okay, and it turns out for first-order systems, so the only quantification, if you will, is so, for example, faster rise time, shorter settling time, tau, that's it, okay? Is that clear? So, for first order systems, it's very simple. Now, how much time do we have? Let's see. We got 10 minutes. So, let me start 
second order systems. We're not going to do this in detail. And I cautioned you that the math for second order systems is very involved, right? And I want, you should read the book if you haven't already been reading it. So, so basically we're going to start sections 4, 4 and 4, 5, which is time response of second order systems. And I'm going to do this slightly differently in the sense I'm going to appeal to your intuition first and then I'm going to do the math. Okay. So I'll put this in red. Please read okay, if you haven't been reading the book because this is pretty, in, it's, not in, it's, okay, it's not intense math, but you got to be careful. right? So first thing we do is what? So what did we do for first order systems? So here's H2. So I need a, so what is the first thing we did for first order systems? It's mirrors for second order. So what do we got to do first? That's second, but before that. What do we need? Chris is right, you got to get the time response. But what do we need to get the time response? Transfer function. We have to pick a form, all right? And this is the standard form. Uh, in the sense, whenever you work with control systems as you find transfer functions, you try to put it in the standard form of A over S plus A for a first order system or this for a second order system. So it's B over S squared plus AS plus B, okay? Now let me... So for second order system, there is an, another form, right? And you should be comfortable with both. Have all of you taken 2070? Yes or no? Prereq, it's a prereq, right? So then have you seen this? Yes, it is a prereq for this class, but you must have seen this, okay? So if you haven't, well, we're going to look at it in this class. So you haven't seen zeta? So zeta is what is called as a damping ratio, right? So here is our x bar. Here is y bar, okay? So let me use this form. Consider, and let's see intuitively what happens. H2 bar is of S So zeta is defined as the damping ratio, okay? Omega n is the natural frequency. What are the units of omega n? What are the units of omega n? It's radians per second. What, are they, what do you think are the units of zeta? It's a damping ratio. What do you think? What do you think are its units? No, radians per second is frequency. So what do you, it tells you how much damping is there in the system. Does it have any units? It's a ratio. No, it's dimensionless. Okay. Dimensionless. And okay. So and this is where we're going to stop in the sense your intuition, right? This is dimensionless. What happens if zeta is zero? What does that mean? So let's look at that. So, sorry? No, for math, forget the math is important, you're right, but practically if zeta is zero, what does it tell you about? How much damping does the system have? Zero. So, yes, excellent, Chris is right. So the system response should be oscillatory, yes? So excellent. So zeta equals zero implies no damping, which implies oscillatory, and we're looking at the step response. Okay? But then let's look at the pole zero plot of the transfer function. So you will see, just like the first order system, you can quantify the type of response using the PZ plot of H2 bar of S, okay, the transfer function. So if zeta equals zero, what is the transfer function? So 
So what happens? Beautiful. Okay, omega n squared over s squared plus omega n squared. Where are the poles? Now be very careful. Right? Huh? Yes, but tell me. That's right. Tell me exactly where they are. What is this? So the poles are when the denominator, the value, the finite values of s, which make the transfer function go to infinity, or the roots of the denominator. Yes. So solve s squared plus omega n squared equals zero. What do you get? So the poles means s squared. Correct. They're on the imaginary axis, but exactly where are they? Equals zero. So what's the solution of this? Almost. There is a j, right? Huh? Yeah. So, but you need the j, right? You can't. This is not plus or minus omega n. Is that very clear? So, in other words, okay. So, s squared is not equal to plus or minus omega n squared. You understand why, right? So, if you plug in plus or minus omega n into this equation, do you actually get zero? No. So is this a solution to this? No. The J is very important, guys. You just can't forget the J. So how do you get the J? Just we'll solve this, right? So you get S squared plus or minus omega. Oops. I'm jumping here. Ah. Omega N squared with a negative sign. Yes? So no, J is included. What are you talking about? No, I didn't ask that. I asked what are the poles of this system. I didn't ask where on the imaginary axis they are. Right? The poles of this system is, well, this is square root of negative 1 times omega n squared, correct? Which is, and hopefully, yeah, square root of negative 1 times plus or minus omega n, which is plus or minus j omega n. Okay? And there goes my projector. All right, so... Let me mark this. Yes. So here is j omega n minus j omega. Okay? So on the imaginary axis, like we guessed. Question? No, okay. So what else? So finally, what do you notice? What kind of, like, in terms of complex numbers, what are these referred to as? This pair. So you have 1 plus j omega n. I mean, not 1 plus j omega n. You have plus j omega n and minus j omega n. So what are these, there's a term in complex numbers for this, and it's very important. Huh? Yeah, complex conjugates. So when you have a physical system, and you have complex poles, okay, they will always occur in conjugate pairs. Because that's what will imply in the time domain, you get sinusoids. Make sense? It's very, so unlike first order systems, which are kind of like overkill, in my opinion, to do in the S domain, second order systems are very important they have very important like interpretations in the S domain. Is that clear? So that's about it. And uh, let's see. Do I want to? Yeah, that's about it. So I was thinking, can I do something else? Now I have only one more minute. So for next lecture, please read this section, right? So next time we're going to look at when omega, I mean, when zeta is not zero, what is the range of zeta, right? So basically, if zeta is zero, zeta is between zero and one. If zeta is equal to one, if zeta is greater than one, right? So it's undamped. This is the undamped case. Zeta between zero and one is underdamped, where you'll have oscillations. Zeta equals one is critically damped, which has the fastest response. Zeta is greater than one is overdamped, right? Those are the four cases.